Welcome to St. James Weil, Sunday the 17th of May. Let's begin with a, a brief morning prayer service and then we'll have the next in our series on the Book of Lamentations. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when we meet as God's people, we are to come with our hearts full of joy and thanksgiving, praising God for his glory and goodness, his majesty and power his justice and love. The scriptures also call on us not to harden our hearts towards God, but to hear his voice and confess our failure to honour and glorify him as we should. So Paul the Apostle writes, Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed which is idolatry. On account of these the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. Let's join together in a general confession in the light of those verses from Colossians. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way and have not loved you as we ought, nor loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have failed to do what we should have done, and we have done what we should not have done. We have broken your commands and justly deserve your condemnation. Father, we are truly sorry. For the sake of Jesus Christ who died for us, forgive us all that is past. By your Spirit turn our hearts to love you and to love our neighbour. Help us to live a godly and obedient life for your honour and glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ promises to pardon and forgive all who truly repent and sincerely believe his holy gospel. May God grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit so that, forgiven and cleansed from our sins, our lives may be holy, shielded by God's power until Christ comes. Amen. Thanks be to God. And let's join together. We praise you, O God. We acknowledge you to be the Lord. All creation worships you, the Father everlasting. To you all angels cry aloud with all the powers of heaven. Cherubim and seraphim ever sing in endless praise. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The goodly fellowship of prophets praise you. The noble army of martyrs praise you. Through all the world your holy church acclaims you. Father of majesty unbounded, your true and only Son, and the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. You, Lord Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you became man to set us free, you did not disdain the virgin's womb. When you overcame the sting of death, you opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You are seated at God's right hand in glory. We believe that you will come to be our judge. Come then, Lord, and help your people, bought with the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. And now let's pray. Be exalted, Lord, above the heavens. Let your glory cover the earth. Keep our nation under your care and guide us in justice and truth. Let your way be known by all people, your saving power among all nations. Send out your light and your truth that we may tell of your saving works. Lord, hear our prayers for we put our trust in you. The Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray for God's people everywhere and for the needs and the peace of the world. Almighty God and Father, sustainer and saviour of your creation, hear our prayers for all people, especially for all Christians throughout the world. Sovereign Lord, direct and govern the leaders of the nations. Give them the will and the wisdom to resolve tension and conflict so that all people may live in harmony and peace. We pray especially for the leaders of our nation. Give wisdom, grace and integrity to the Queen of Australia, to the Prime Minister, to the Premier and to all members of Parliament. Strengthen all judges, magistrates and police to uphold justice and truth. Help our nation to share the resources you have given us so that people everywhere may enjoy with gratitude the fruits of your creation. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you, Lord of all, for the gifts of Christ our Ascended King, for apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. Send out your light and truth through those who proclaim Christ. Fill with compassion and spiritual understanding the pastors of your church. May their lives and their teaching commend the truth of your word Give your heavenly grace, Lord, to all your people, and especially to this congregation. Renew us and make us holy. Help us to live in the unity of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, enabling us to persevere together in the hope of glory, living in peace with one another. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. We commend to your fatherly care, merciful God, all those who in this passing world are in any kind of trouble, sorrow, sickness, anxiety or need. And in a few moments of silence we name those who are known to us. Give them patience and confidence in your goodness and in your mercy provide their every need. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. We praise your name for all your servants in whose life and death Christ has been honoured. Grant that encouraged by their witness we may run the race that is set before us and with them share the fullness of joy at your right hand through Christ who is the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Amen. And let's pray for God's protection. Lord our heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to this day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that today we may not fall into sin or run into any kind of danger, but lead and govern us in all things that we may do what is right in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we're going to have our two Bible readings, Psalm 88 and Lamentations 3. The first reading, Psalm 88. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I am overwhelmed with troubles and my life draws near to death. I am counted amongst those who go down to the pit. I am like one without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. 
Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness, or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbour. Darkness is my closest friend. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Lamentations chapter 3. I am a man who has seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. He has made my skin and my flesh grow old and has broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. He has walled me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Even when I call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has barred my way with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked. Like a bear lying in wait, like a lion in hiding, he dragged me from the path and mangled me and left me without help. He drew his bow and made me the target for his arrows. He pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. I became the laughing stock of all my people. They mock me in song all day long. He has filled me with bitter herbs and given me gall to drink. He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me in the dust. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say, my splendour is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall, I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Let him bury his face in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him offer his cheek to the one who would strike him, and let him be filled with the disgrace. For no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. To crush underfoot all prisoners in the land, to deny people their rights before the Most High, to deprive them of justice, would not the Lord see such things? Who can speak and have it happen if the Lord has not decreed it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? Why should the living complain when punished for their sins? Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and our hands to God in heaven and say, We have sinned and rebelled, and you have not forgiven. You have covered yourself with anger and pursued us. You have slain without pity. You have covered yourself with the cloud so that no prayer can get through. You have made us scum and refuse among the nations. All our enemies have opened their mouths wide against us. We have suffered terror and pitfalls, ruin and destruction. Streams of tears flow from my eyes because my people are destroyed. My eyes will flow unceasingly without relief 
until the Lord looks down from heaven and sees, what I see brings grief to my soul because of all the women of my city. Those who are my enemies without cause hunted me like a bird. They tried to end my life in a pit and threw stones at me. The waters closed over my head and I thought I was about to perish. I called on your name, Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ears to my cry for relief. You came near when I called you and you said, do not fear. You, Lord, took up my case. You redeemed my life. Lord, you have seen the wrong done to me. Uphold my cause. You've seen the depth of their vengeance, all their plots against me. Lord, you have heard their insults, all their plots against me. What my enemies whisper and mutter against me all day long. Look at them, sitting or standing, they mock me in their songs. Pay them back what they deserve, Lord, for what their hands have done. Put a veil over their hearts and may your curse be on them. Pursue them in anger and destroy them for under the heavens of the Lord. For the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Well, let's look at Lamentations chapter 3. We won't look at every verse of the 66 verses, I can promise you, but we will look at what they say in general. I've called it Hope in Adversity. I got confused the other day. My wife is cleaning out her study and she was throwing out old maths textbooks. I'm confused. Life in Jesus' time was very different to life in our day. But in Jesus' time, II plus II equals IV. Really doesn't matter what point of history, or what country, or even whether you time travel into the future. 2 plus 2 will still equal 4. How on earth can you have an old mathematics book? And in fact, if I told you 2 plus 2 equals 5, we wouldn't have a discussion you would think I was an idiot and you just walk away. History is much more interesting. We can agree to disagree and argue for hours and get nowhere. Sometimes I wish language was as precise as mathematics. Take the word hope. Hope in adversity, I've called this sermon. I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow because we've got a picnic or something like that. Now, it's what I'd like but I have absolutely no control over it and I have absolutely no assurance of what's going to happen. Even the Weather Bureau haven't got any idea. According to them it was supposed to be raining so heavy at the moment that the rain on the tin roof would mean we couldn't record this. I hope the meal I'm cooking tonight turns out okay. Now I have a little bit of control over that but of course things can go wrong and there's no assurance of it. I hope that the train is on time. Well, of course, that's often a false hope, certainly something we have no control over. According to the dictionary, hope is the feeling that what is wanted can be had, or that will, events will turn out for the best, probably. There's certainly no assurance in it. When Christians use the word hope, it's different. It's a sure and certain hope. It's in fact a certainty. It's based on, based on faith. The writer of the Hebrews says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. A sure and certain hope. We'll come back to that at the end. In Lamentations chapter 3, there are three sections. The Lord's love and mercy to us is unending, verses 1 to 24. The Lord's goodness and control of our lives is reassuring, verses 25 to 39. And the Lord's forgiveness and answers to our prayers are encouraging, verses 40 to 66. So let's look at verses 1 to 24. The Lord's love and mercy to us is unending. The chapter begins with these words. 
I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again, all day long. Jeremiah tells us that he is suffering because of God's wrath, because of God's anger. We talked about that last week. But the important thing to notice about these verses is that Jeremiah sees it as being personal. Now, we always find it easy to blame someone else. I mean, I'm the way I am because of my parents, and it's easy to blame them because they've been dead for a long time. Or, I'm the way I am because I don't have any money. Or because I live in a suburb that's really not very good. Or, of course, I'm not to blame because it's, it's society. It's a mess. It's sinful. And I'm being punished because of all the heathen out there. Now, that wasn't Jeremiah's point of view. Jeremiah has been faithful when others haven't. But he doesn't blame them. He accepts it personally. You see, he may not be as bad as some of the others, but he is not blameless. There are no first and second class sins. Comparisons with others don't matter. We are sinful and we deserve God's anger. And then verse 7, he has walled me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Even when I cry, call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has barred my way with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked. Jeremiah feels alone and helpless and he feels as though God doesn't care. Today, many feel exactly the same been interesting to note this week that there is a new uh, national assistant health director set up just for mental health because people are concerned about the sense of loneliness the sense of helplessness that so many have and we've all of course had that feeling that God isn't listening that our prayers are only getting up to the ceiling and going no further Jeremiah goes on, verse 19, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. You see, Jeremiah thinks back on his life. It hasn't been an easy life. He has had affliction. He has wandered, which is the role of the prophet. He's had bitterness. What's happened before might not be as bad as what's happening at the moment. Might not be the same. But he says, I think about it and therefore I have hope. Because you see, I've been through it before and God has brought me out of it. Now you've had the same experience. You've had things happen in your life which have hurt, which have been difficult to deal with. But as you look back, you'll see that God has got you through it. That's why in the present situation, which may be different to anything you've ever encountered before, you look back and you still have hope that God will get you through it. There is hope because it worked out last time. And then verse 22 begins the key to the whole book. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. This is the key to the whole book, because Jeremiah here sets out what he really believes and trusts in trusts in. I am not consumed, I am not destroyed because of God's love. God has promised we'll never be tested 
beyond our limits of endurance. <laughs> now, of course, the downside of that is the stronger my faith, the greater the test. That's not good, is it? But that's the way it is. Because the truth, of course, is the more on fire you are for God, the more Satan is your enemy. The stronger your faith, the more power Satan has to use to test it. But God sets limits. Remember the story of Job. God set limits on what Satan could do. So great is God's faithfulness, Jeremiah says. New every morning. What a great truth. Sometimes it seems weird to say great is God's faithfulness. In a prisoner of war camp, for example, when Christians said great is God's faithfulness, it seemed a strange thing to say. In the middle of an earthquake or a cyclone or a flood or a drought, great is God's faithfulness seems a strange thing to say. In the middle of a pandemic, great is God's faithfulness seems a strange thing to say. And yet it's true. God is faithful. And that's new every morning. It never gets stale. God is faithful whatever the situation so, Jeremiah says, I will wait for him. Patience is one of the gifts of the Spirit. Patience is something most of us are not very good at. It's one of the gifts we have to keep praying for and keep working at. Jeremiah had patience. Now, he had to wait a whole generation for God to bring about the end result. Jeremiah didn't get to see all that resulted at the end, but he still had faith in the greatness of God. And then verses 25 to 39, the Lord's goodness and control of our lives is reassuring. Verses 25 and 26, the Lord is good to those who hope in, whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. What a wonderful promise. God who is good to those whose hope is in him. Wait quietly, Jeremiah says. You see, often when there are problems, we rush around trying to solve them in our own strength. We're a flurry of activity. We try to get things done. But Jeremiah says, wait quietly. Now that's not a suggestion of idleness. You have to do your bit, but you do it with patience and you do it without worry. For example, there's no good sitting at home praying that you'll get a job. You have to go out and try and get one. But you do it quietly with trust in the God of your hope. And then verse 31, For no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love, for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. It's not forever. There is an end. It's guaranteed. And although he might bring grief, he has compassion his love is unfailing. In his anger, as he deals with sin, he still has compassion. He still has mercy. He still has love. Would not the Lord see such things, the prophet asks? God is not blind. He knows what's happening. Sometimes we wonder. Remember the prophet Habakkuk? God, why don't you act? You're not doing anything. I keep asking you and nothing happens. And you remember, of course, when God did answer, it wasn't quite the answer Habakkuk wanted. Now we can feel the same. Why isn't God doing something? But God sees everything and he knows what we're going through. So verse 37, who can speak and have it happen if the Lord has not decreed it? 
Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? Why should the living complain when punished for their sins? Great truth. Nothing happens without God making it happen. God controls both the good and the bad. This is not a world which is sailing along out of control. It is a world that is within God's control. We don't understand why he does things, but he is in control. And don't complain, Jeremiah says, about punishment for your sins. Instead of complaining, do something. Repent. That's the first step. And then when you've repented, evangelize your community so that they might repent. And then the third section, verses 40 to 66, the Lord's forgiveness and answers to our prayers are encouraging. Verse 40, let us examine our ways and test them. And let us return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and our hands to God in heaven and say, we have sinned and rebelled and you have not forgiven. Self-examination leads to repentance. There is a time for us to stop and look at how God sees us. The word of God, we're told, is a mirror. It's a strange sort of mirror, though. When we look into it, we don't see a reflection of ourselves, but we see ourselves as God sees us. Lift up your hands, he says. That means prayer. For the Jew prayed, standing with hands lifted. Tell God that you repent. It might seem you have not been forgiven. It might seem you are still being punished. It might seem that God has not kept his word, but he has. I called on your name, verse 55, from the depths of the pit, and you heard my plea. Do not close your ears to my cry for relief. You came near when I called you, and you said, Do not fear. You, Lord, took up my case. You redeem my life. Lord, you have seen the wrong done to me. Uphold my cause. You have seen the depth of their vengeance, all their plots against me. Lord, you have heard their insults, all their plots against me. God is never deaf. God never turns his back. God never shuts his ears. God never is too busy to hear our prayers. He hears your prayers always. You know, prayer is one of the greatest gifts that God has given us. Prayer is an opportunity to share with God everything you feel, knowing that God is listening and understanding. And that's why the chapter finishes with a statement that seems unchristian, but is in fact realistic. Pay them back what they deserve, Lord for what their hands have done. Put a veil over their hearts and may your curse be on them. Pursue them in anger and destroy them from under the heavens of the Lord. I once had a book that I really enjoyed, very unchristian. It was called Don't Get Mad, Get Even. Now, we may feel this way. Retribution feels good. So let's put this into its context. Let's get it clear. You see... It may seem unchristian, but we are called on to ask God for whatever we want, to tell him how we feel. It may make us feel better. But God doesn't say you have to pray prayers that are theologically correct. If that's how you feel, pray it. But note this. We are asking God to deal with those who persecute. It's not in our hands. God does bring his judgment on those who oppose him. It's not our role to do it. So this chapter has been about hope in a time of, of adversity. A hope that we can have in our current adversity. And it all is based on faith. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see the writer of the Hebrew says. He also says we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, 
firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. That's 6.19. And in 10.23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And Peter, in his letter, chapter 3 of the first verse, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope is based on the resurrection. It's based on what God has already done for us. How can we strengthen it? But it's also based on the scriptures. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. That's Romans 15.4. So Lamentations 3 gives us an assurance of hope in adversity. It's a hope based on our faith, our faith in a good and loving God who is compassionate and who is merciful. It's based on our understanding of God, of how God has acted in the past through his word and indeed how he's acted in the past through our experiences. It's a thing that should keep us going when we're feeling down, when we're feeling tired, when we're feeling lonely, and we're wondering if what we're suffering at the moment will ever end. It's the hope that keeps us going. Let's say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen. Now part of that was the text, Great is God's Faithfulness. There is, of course, a very familiar hymn. What I'm going to do is to put the words on the screen and uh, we'll have the music playing and maybe you can sing it together at home. If you're there on your own, just sing it on your own. That's fine. Indeed, if I'm watching it, I better be on my own because otherwise I'll upset people. But as you sing it, look at the words and think about them. Great is thy faithfulness. O oh God, my Father.